Um, it first began, or at least was, was published through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 28, when he, like most of the prophets, would have this daunting task of having to address and then shepherd a very rebellious and stubborn people. And of course, like most of us, we would ask, well, how, Lord? And he says, well, take them through the word. And of course, Isaiah, seeking deeper understanding, well, in what way? And the Spirit would tell Isaiah, line upon line, precept upon precept, very much birthing the idea that when we go to study the Scriptures, to meet with the Lord, we should start at the beginning and go until the end. I see light bulbs turning on. This is <laughs> revelation being given. But what's beautiful about that is we see that same practice taking place within the life of the disciples and was even exercised by the Lord himself. So this is not anything new, as Solomon would say, underneath the sun. But what you should be sort of discerning right now, well, wait a minute, if other churches aren't doing this, then indeed there must be something wrong. Oh, here comes the challenge from the pastor. God has set forth a method for us to meet with him and to have fellowship. And it is through the teaching of his word. Biblical premises. So we are in Acts chapter 5 this morning. But sort of to preface it, I think we need to look at a part of Acts chapter 4. So there we see, um, and you guys sort of remember the context, severe opposition has now come against the apostles. As they would be preaching the resurrection. That this Messiah who would come and suffer for the people. Again, in our place, the words we use is substitution. Christ would die in our place for our sins. For the Bible heralds the truth that he who knew no sin by the Father would be made sin. So that we who are the sinners naturally would be made the righteousness of Christ. And they're proclaiming it. And of course, with that truth being proclaimed, opposition would ensue. And why that delights me is because as a church, we're getting ready to do our first day of evangelism. You guys, like the apostles, are going to go out and share the truth. Dun, 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 dun. And this grand day will take place at Cardinal Days, June 22nd. Um, I think it's the fourth annual. And, and as our... Vision for it develops, um, we'll make it known to you, but essentially we're basically going to be setting up a table with a canopy, uh, flood the table with some flyers, and pray that the Lord would draw people by. At that point, you would begin to share your faith by simply either inviting them to truth or maybe even led to share their testimonies. Wow. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> now, I don't know if you find that in Acts, the piano <laughs> emphasis, but I have to trust that in their minds... But if you recall, this great opposition was coming against them. And as the apostles would have been arrested and, of course, have gone before this, this um, dignified council who would have assembled with the simple premise, obviously, to charge these men because of the, of the, you know, the um, trouble they were causing. And, of course, the problem was that within their truth, there was the miraculous taking place and there was this healing taking place. And the evidence of the things that they proclaimed could not be denied. But this council would meet and they would sort of scratch their heads and wonder, well, what can we do? And of course, their simple conclusion, because you cannot do anything to stop the truth. Because if you recall, while they were waiting in their cell and this jury and these, these pseudo judges were acting about what they should do, it says that the people outside continued to grow in their belief. And if you recall, sort of the tagline or the application was, it was too late. The word had already been spread. Well, they decide that they would just uh, severely threaten them. And, of course, the apostles would be threatened, but they would go outside. Of course, they would challenge uh, that group, that council, and say, well, who are we supposed to follow, man or God? Mm -hmm. Judge for yourself, the apostle would say. So, of course, they would go out in the spirit of boldness because they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and they would continue to proclaim the truth. But they would also go back and meet up with the other disciples, and they would tell them all the things that took place. And, of course, hearing this, I would imagine, like for some of us, having heard about our friends who were sharing their faith and experiencing opposition, uh, perhaps being silenced, um, or perhaps being fired, or perhaps seeing you know, a relationship now change, or, or whatever may be the consequence, they would get together and they would have a remedy. And the remedy was, of course, corporate 
prayer. Mm -hmm. They would pray together. Mm -hmm. I've heard it said many times that those who pray together stay together. Yeah. And that's what was taking place. And of course, in their prayer, you would see them cry out. And when they were crying out, what was cool yeah. was their cries would be according to the word of God. Mm -hmm. They would reference and quote scriptures. Mm -hmm. Scriptures that would very much identify and depict their very situation. In many ways, for me, it was like the scriptures coming alive. Prophecy being fulfilled. But they would cry out using the heart of David and say, God, they've done this against your people. And they would seek him for strength. And of course, while this is taking place, it says that they were given now one heart and one mind. And of course, um, and then it begins the transition. And within this, there came sort of the spirit of sharing all things together. And what, we, what happened next is the chapter would be closed. Well, let me read it to you. Let's pick up in verse... Uh, 35 and it says there and they laid them at the apostles feet and this is talking about those who have these different possessions and what they would do based upon based upon oh well not today this hasn't been happening very much lately let's get rid of it now. so pray for our radio ministry because I'm going to have to make up this study sometime probably in the back room by myself <laughs> But if you recall, well, let me just read it to you. Um, Acts chapter 4, verse 35, and it says, And they laid them at the apostles' feet. And, of course, the context there is these lands that were sold, and what they would do is they would take the proceeds, and they would now give them to the apostles. And the apostles have now been given this stewardship of now using the funds as the Spirit would lead them. And how would the Spirit lead them? They would distribute across the church those who would have need. And it says that they would distribute them to anyone that had need. And then look what it says in verse 36 of Acts chapter 4. And then Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, and here's the translation, son of encouragement. So this guy, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, was given this very sweet nickname. There was something about Barnabas where he naturally encouraged the body. And the apostles saw that. And they gave him this beautiful nickname. What well, says there in verse 37 that he too had land and he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Again, we learn from the scripture there, the language that the money refers to his entire proceeds of the sale. 100%. He didn't give 10%. He gave 100%. Setting forth a model and a precedent. But what we love about that story is it says he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, when we step into Acts chapter 5, what we're going to discover is Barnabas' motive being exposed. You see, he had a sincere heart, and he did it with selfless motive. You see, Barnabas had what I call the pilgrim mindset. He didn't live for this life. He had the eternal perspective. You see, he wasn't possessed by the material treasures of the world, but his heart was possessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, these things... And these things are not bad things. But when you're a Christian, you must esteem them less than your esteem towards the Lord. Mm -hmm. They must have less precedent and value in your life. You cannot be possessed by them. And that was Barnabas. He's like, Lanch, he had an acreage. Right? He had all of Jackson. He had all of Lamar's. And he just sold it because he saw there was a need within the body. But he had a pilgrim's, pilgrim's mindset. Perhaps you re recall Paul's mindset there in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, where he says, I count all things lost. You see, there was this spirit and this attitude among the apostles and the disciples that that which was most important was knowing the Lord Jesus. And they went around and they would remove anything that would distract them or obscure them from getting to know him. Again, setting forth an example for us. If there are things that are consuming your life or distracting you from spending time in the word, Get rid of them. Yeah. In fact, you know what Jesus told the disciples and the multitudes there in the, Mount, Mount, uh, ser the Sermon on the Mount? Was if your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. Right? If your surfboard's causing you to stumble, give it away. And I did when we moved here. I thought about it yesterday. I wonder how my board is doing. <laughs> right? But you give it away. No longer being a treasure in this man's heart. But what I love about Barnabas and, of course, the words of Christ was they were not attached to the worldly treasures. 
Again, <coughs> what we learn from this is don't let the things of the world possess you. They are your possessions. And use them and give them away as the Lord would have you. But look what happens in Acts chapter 5. Something very similar happens. Acts chapter 5 verse 1. And it says there, but a certain man named Ananias. Now the word Ananias means God is gracious. Well, let's find out. <laughs> and it says there with Sapphira, his wife, they sold a possession as well. Now the name Sapphira is where we get our word sapphire. And it means beautiful. So there's something about this couple that was gracious and, and they were beautiful. And it says there they too had this possession and they sold it. Now, what Luke is trying to tell us here is that they were this landholder and they were a holder of the deed, and they got rid of it too. Now, what we appear what appears here is that this couple was following the model and the attitude of the spirit-led giving demonstrated by the believer named Barnabas. Now, when it comes to giving, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says this: And each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Notice we do not take an offering. By the way, we never take anything. It's about receiving an offering. It is not mine. Just like we see within Acts chapter 4, when the money comes in, we pray about it. How would you want it to be distributed, Lord? And then we send it out. We send it out. It's not ours. It is the Lord's. So when you're writing a check, you may fill in Calvary Chapel, but you might as well write in Jesus Christ because it is His. It is the first fruits that you have given. Now you now want to offer as a means of worship unto Him, saying, I trust you for all that you have given, and I want to just proclaim my love to you. You put it in the back in that little box, and then it's given out as the need is made known to the church. So it's all about the heart. And here we see a couple following Barnabas, and let's see if they have the same motive. Well, verse 2. And it says there, and he... He, so this is the head, this is the authority within that family, and he kept back part of the proceeds. Now there in the, in the language, what it does is it gives us the picture that he did it secretly. You see, his intention was to keep it for himself. His wife also being aware of it, so apparently she knew or she was privy to it. But for me, there was some type of agreement. This was a plotted deception. You see, they were working together. And it says, and they brought a certain part of it, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, the part of the proceeds that they gave, it's undisclosed, so we don't know. We could surmise that it probably looked like the full amount. Who would really know? And it says there, but Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? So that word why in essence means how. How could this have happened if you had been rolling with this as one of the disciples? You were among us, but apparently you were not of us. Believe it or not, within the church, there are those who have a false confession. They may sound like Christians. They may dress like a Christian. You see me and Jesus this morning? What's up with that? We're like twins, right? He might dress like the pastor. He might sound like the pastor and have the same haircut as the pastor. But that does not validate the work of God in his heart. That does not validate the conversion. So here they were among the disciples... But apparently their motive was different. And Peter would confront them and say, Satan has filled your heart and you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Now that word there, lie, literally means to deceive. Now when it comes to deception, we discover that there's someone pinned in the scriptures who is called a deceiver. And his name is the devil. Again, devil is another word for deceiver. We find this in Revelation chapter 20 and there in chapter 12. That, he's, that he goes out to deceive the whole world. But what we discover from this is that Satan first lies directly to God. He lies directly to God. Secondly, he then fills the person's heart to deceive. He fills his heart to such a degree that he would now influence this man to lie to man and to lie to God. Now what's crazy about that word filled, it's the same word that we use back in Acts chapter 2 when it talks about the spirit indwelling within a believer. Ananias and Sapphira in lieu of being filled with the Spirit, they were now filled with the deception of Satan. Every ember of their being was now filled with lies and deceit. 
Again, it's the same as receiving the Holy Spirit. It's as if they have received Satan. Now, when we look at John chapter 8, verse 44, we discover that Satan is a liar and he's the father of all lies. But what's crazy about this is what we discover is that the, the, the bullseye or the target for his attack is first man's mind and then his heart. Mm -hmm. Then his heart. That's why when we cry out, God give us holy eyes, holy ears, holy mouths, holy hands, and holy feet. So that we too might not be deceived. That's why when we look at the Old Testament, they would take the oil and they would place it at these parts. Because they wanted to be consecrated unto the Lord. And if you call yourself a Christian, that image is for you. Everything about your life must be given over to Him. It's called devotion. It's called sanctification that you've now been set aside for Him. And if you aren't, you will be prone to and susceptible to the lies. You will be deceived. If you are not reading your Bible every day, I would guess that you are a target to be deceived. <gasps> There's an easy remedy. Thank you for the piano. <laughs> Read your Bible. My sidekick. I see my wife's sidekick. I'll take your ticket. And it says there, but you have lied to the Holy Spirit by keeping back part of the price of the land for yourself. So in essence, they were claiming publicly. So this is their public confession because they laid it at the apostles' feet. So it's a public event. I'm glad we don't do that. Our offering is under the cloak of obscurity. It's in a box in the back, and no one sees nothing. It's private. It's unto you and the Lord. We don't watch. There was a time about two and a half years ago where a door might have opened for me to pastor a church, and they received the offering publicly. Nothing wrong with that. We did that at my old church in California. That's what Raul did. He wanted to give people an opportunity to worship in their tithes and offerings. But I did notice something about this little church, that when the plate was passed around, you saw everyone raise up their check like this. And I raised up my single dollar because that's all we had. Mm -hmm. But my heart was right towards the Lord. But I remember looking at everybody's check. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so wealthy, right? But my eyes <laughs> saw. And the same with Ananias and Sapphira. It was this, this public deceit. Again, they would tell the apostles, this is the full amount that the property was sold for. But look what Pete says, verse 4. He says, but while it remained, in other words, before it was not sold, was it not yours? In other words, as the owner of something, can we not do as we wish? Well, certainly, we're the owner. Now, the interesting thing about ownership is if you have now given your life over to Christ, you are claiming him to be thy owner of thy soul. Do you treat him like your owner? I was reading this week, and I was exhorted by this author named A.W. Tozer. It might have been Andrew Murray, but he said something like, we didn't say Tim, but the Spirit was talking to me like, Hey, Tim, will you actually live this day acting as if Jesus is truly your master? Because when I would reflect on my day, guess who mainly lords over my day? Yeah. King Tim. King Tim. And I thought about the way I ran my life and the decisions I made, how self-centered they were. It's almost like even as a pastor, Jesus was a second thought or an afterthought. And yet, as the owner, like they are over this possession of land, can they not do as they wish? And if indeed I am now in his namesake and a Christian, therefore a follower of Christ, can he not do in my life as he wishes? As I sit there and cry because the floods have come and the storm has come upon my life, can he not do as he wishes? Well, look what, ha look what happens. <laughs> I love the word of God. It's a serious moment and there should be. And then it goes on and says, and after it was sold... In other words, you no longer had the, the property in your possession, but you now had the money in your possession. Was it not also in your control? In other words, at your disposal? In other words, as with the land and now the profit, can't you do with it as you please? As you please? He says then, but why have you conceived this thing in your heart? So here the application is about motive. In other words, Ananias and Sapphira, what were you hoping to accomplish what was your hoped for outcome with this public charade and display of bringing forth the money? Again, to them it was now looking like this deceitful plot. It looked like they wanted to trick or fool the body. And we've all done that, haven't we? Played the body a fool. How are you doing, Tim? Oh, I'm still down. Man, it's a rad day. When inside, I'm like, oh my gosh. Right? I'm hurting. 
But Lord forbid I be vulnerable and, and, and reveal mm. that I'm in a bad spot. Mm. I'm making you the fool. And that's what's taking place. Verse 5. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down. And he breathed his last breath. In essence, the spirit or the ghost, King James Version, he had departed. But what's crazy about this, it was unexpected. In either words, simultaneously as Peter is accusing him and confronting him, Ananias just falls over dead. Now the crazy part, and the scripture doesn't really disclose it to us, I wonder what Pete's at reaction was. Imagine if Pastor Tim, not Pastor Pete, came to confront you about something, and I'm like, man, you know what? I see this is going on. And, and rather than you, con you know, challenging me or debating or repenting, you just fall over and die. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, right? But Peter's reaction is not disclosed. But the bodies is, because look what happens next. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Now, the word is terror. And what I hate is that the church tries to say, oh, it refers to reverence. No. The word there in the Greek is phobia. People feared God. They feared him. They feared him. That if they were ever to be tempted in the sin and engage in it, they knew the hand of God would come upon with his wrath and smote him. They feared him. They feared him. But it's a healthy fear. It's a fear that we need to have. For me, as I'm growing in my walk with him, as that fear is now intensifying in my own life, that fear has kept me from falling so many times because I was afraid of the outcome. I was afraid of the outcome. We need to have a healthy fear of God. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says that the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Young folks, you want to be wise? Fear the Lord. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, that to hate sin is the fear of the Lord. Do you hate sin? Do you hate sin? Boy, all you guys look so bummed out. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> Let me give you one more verse. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 20 through 21. God commands us to fear him. To fear him. But it is a good fear. And it came upon all the people when they heard these things. So imagine here, he's referring to the general population, not just the believers of the church, but also the unbelievers alike. But imagine how fast news spread. Man, I, ho I heard they showed the Calvary at the 10 a.m. service and someone died. <laughs> I wonder if our church would grow. <laughs> well, let's find out. Verse, chapter, uh, verse 6. And then the young men arose. Now check this out. I love this. It looks like they're birthing this new ministry into the church. It says, and the young men rose and they wrapped him and they carried him out and they buried him. So here we see these young men in this ministry functioning as, as pallbearers or grave diggers. Imagine if our ushers <laughs> had to carry out the bodies, embalm them, and then bury them. But what's crazy about this is that it says here that they acted immediately. Now, what I read as we look at Jerusalem because of the climate and the different things, apparently bodies decayed and rotted quicker. So the burial and embalming process, like we saw with Christ, it almost happens immediately. But I don't want to attribute it to the natural circumstances. It was fear of the Lord that led them, and they took care of business. Now, verse 7. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in. Now, actually there in the language, it doesn't necessarily quantify the three hours. It's about a short time. But it, what it says here is that his wife came in. Now, what I wonder is where was she when her husband was being confronted? Was she out spending her portion of the part that was kept back? Was she out shopping? Just throwing that out there. <laughs> See, that's why it's so bad to have commentary. You just got to teach the word instead of all my little comments. But again, these are the things as I'm praying and I'm looking at the scriptures. Lord, what's taking place? In fact, a good practice for you Bible students is put yourself there. Put yourself there and begin to imagine what your experience and reaction to the things that are taking place would be like. After all... Same Christ, same spirit, same baptism to us disciples who call ourselves followers now. Nothing has changed. And it says there that his wife came in not knowing what had happened. In essence, she was coolest to the whole event. And Peter asked her. Now I wonder about Peter's tone. Was it one of interrogation? Was there this air of seriousness because her husband had just died? Or was it a casual confirmation? 
Look what happens next. Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, now, in quickly and sort of kind of a, a tertiary or superficial sort of look, you would think that she just sort of would confirm the things that Pete said. But actuality in the language, what she began to do was prepare a speech and give the story play by play. I would imagine she was probably mimicking or repeating her husband to a T, almost like a rehearsed script. And it says there, play by play, well, certainly. And then she would go through having laid the money or the pile of money there at Pete's feet. Feet. She says, yes, for so much. And then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together? In other words, there's this conspiracy now to test the spirit of the Lord. So what he's saying here is that you have tempted God to see if he will even carry out his word or judgment to those who disobey. She was tempting God. I don't think he'll keep his word. Secondly, perhaps she was testing that the Holy Spirit didn't really rule over the hearts of the disciples and the apostles. I don't think the Spirit's really here. He's not really watching. He's not omnipresent, as the scriptures would say. Testing the Lord, testing the Spirit. And the same type of tempting, if you recall, we saw when Satan did this to Jesus there in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. The same tempting that the Pharisees would later do to the Lord. But what I love about this is the name there. The Spirit of the Lord. Yeah. Ultimately, when you act in maliciously, in deceit, or craftily, it's against the Lord Jesus himself. It's against the Lord. You might think you're lying against man, the pastor, Perhaps the body, but in essence, when you're lying against the Spirit of the Lord, you're lying to the Lord Jesus directly. He gets involved. In fact, that's the crazy thing. Sinning is not a private matter. It's not. There's so much more involved than just you. Oh, I just did it against myself. No, that's a lie. There's great fallout to sin. And it says there, look, the feet of those who have buried your husband, they are at the door. In other words, I wonder if they were waiting or anticipating. Again, they just got done you know, burying the husband, and now they're waiting for the wife. It's like they have these married plots. <laughs> and it says there, and they will carry you out to, in other words, you, you will be condemned to, and you are next. Then immediately, verse 10, it says that she fell at his feet, and she breathed her last. And the young men came in and they found her dead and they carried her out and they buried her husband. Again, what's crazy about burying her husband, the language there is actually they were face to face. So where they were together, they were together in their sin and now they're together in their judgment and now they're together there in their death. If you see your spouse sinning, don't be a part of it. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for righteousness. Like standing for righteousness, so goes salvation. Mm -hmm. We're not saved on the buddy system. Right. Each person has to make a personal decision to receive the truth that Christ died in your place. And you personally have to repent. There is no buddy system when we stand before the Lord. The Bible says that every man shall bow his knee and every mouth shall confess. As goes sin, as goes salvation. And she would fall to, and now she'd be put face to face with her husband. So great fear, verse 11, mirroring what we saw just a few lines before. It says, it came upon now the whole church, not just the people. So here we see that the entire church was gripped with this awe and with this dread. But what's crazy about that word church is this is the first time that they would be used for the believers in Jerusalem. The word there is ecclesia, the sent out ones. June 22nd, when we're at Cardinal Days, you're going to be sent out. You're going to try to hide behind me at the table. I'm like, come on, <laughs> Ecclesia, go out. <laughs> but I'll go out too. And it says there, and it came upon all who heard these things. So what I love about this, it's no longer just this dread throughout sort of the city, but it's the community or the body of believers there in Jerusalem who now have heard these things, and now they are walking in awe and dread of the Lord. Finally, the church is being corrected. And the last couple of verses, we're going to do verses 12 through 16, and then we'll be done. Although verses 17 through 21 have a neat announcement, we're probably not going to get to it. Verse 12, and it says this, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were being done among the people. So at this time... At this time, there seemed to be like this special anointing or this consecration of the Spirit upon the apostles. 
But what's crazy is that same anointing will now transcend among the deacons there. We find this in chapter 6, 7, and 8, and it's getting ready to spread throughout the church. So the very thing that he was doing through the apostles, we're getting, he being the Holy Spirit, we're getting ready to see, to do throughout the whole body. And it says there they did many signs. Again, it's just this great number. It was not only impressive, but it was obvious and apparent to all. And it says there that it just brought, the word wonders means awe or awesome or wonderful. And they were doing these things among the people. And they were, they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Now what's crazy about this is Solomon's porch was a part of the temple area. They didn't have a place to gather. They didn't have sweet tan. And I know many of us have condemned the gift of sweet tan. Oh, it's too small. I can't do this. I don't know what's up with the heat or the air conditioning. I don't know. And yet they didn't even have this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had to congregate outside in an area called Solomon's Porch. Again, this would have been the, sh the first street address of the first church. But what's beautiful about that statement is it says they were in one accord, which means one mind and they had one passion. But check this out. The word accord is actually a compound word. It means rushing along and in unison. Again, this would have been something that was unique to the characteristic of the Christian church. But here's the image that Luke wants to give us. It's actually a musical word. That when it came to the church at this time, they blended together in this beautiful harmony led by the Holy Spirit. Like when we did worship today. Alone, we sound horrible. <laughs> but together, harmonious to the Lord. Again, here we see that the church is God's melody or is his song. In mm. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says that you are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. And you've been crafted to go forward and to do good deeds. But that word there for workmanship is actually poema, where we get our English word poem. So not only are we discovering that we are the melody or the song of the Lord, but you're actually his poem. In other words, as this great divine poet would sit down to pen a letter or a poem, he would choose to use earthen vessels, which is man, to send forth his message. It's you. Yes, Romans chapter 1, that he could proclaim the gospel through the stars and through the universe, through the open skies. But that's not how he's chosen to do it. He's chosen to do it through fallen man who's been saved by the grace of God. It's you. It's the Christian church. It is now not only your responsibility and duty, but also your blessed privilege. Jesus is like, I'm leaving and I need someone to speak on my behalf. Um, Otrogi, what are you doing Friday nights? All right, cool, dial you in, right? That's essentially, essentially what took place. But here's, there's this harmony, and I hope it's encouraging you because it encourages me. He says, he says, none of the rest dared to join them. So at this point, no one else was cleaving in. Why is that? Because we learn throughout the scriptures that within their culture, they were now at the risk of being excommunicated and being persecuted. But it says there, the people still began to esteem them highly. It's kind of funny, and I want to finish this, but it's kind of like Calvary Chapel. I don't want to exaggerate, but let's say a hundred at least 100 people since we've moved here in three years have pulled me, a thought, pulled me aside and expressed how grateful God finally brought a Calvary Chapel. But they had always concluded that statement with, but I'm not coming. <laughs> I'm so glad for 20 years we've been saying, bring a Bible study, but I'm not going to come. Good, they would not cleave with the work taking place here, but they esteemed us highly. Oh, we love the teaching of the word, but I'm not going to listen to it. <laughs> Again, I'm, like, I'm trying to give you the mindset of the things that are taking place, but that word cleave is so important because it's actually a supernatural work that takes place when the Holy Spirit is leading a man to Christ. We find this in Matthew chapter 4 when God would call the fishermen to himself and when Jesus would call Luke there from the tax collecting booth. These boys would cleave. Marriage, cleaving, no longer two, now one. We cleave to each other. Boys, mommy boys, you got to leave your mommy. You got to cleave to your wife. No longer two, now one. Yes, the church was esteemed, but people were afraid to come here and sit in the teaching of the word. Amazing. Let me finish. Verse 14. And the believers were increasingly added to the church. So this blows me away because here they're saying people won't cleave to him for the fear. But at the same time, God was still saving those whom he would save. And it says that they keep being added, uh, kept being added. Again, added means continually growing. Again, there was no decrease in spite of Ananias and Sapphira dying. The church still grew. 
the church still grew. <laughs> so even my mistakes when I put my foot in the mouth, the church can still grow. Thank God it's not up to me. And it says the multitudes of both now men and women, you guys remember, or gals remember, as we took a census just a couple weeks ago, as the 5,000 were added, you wouldn't count the women. And now you're being counted. Mm. Why is that? Because the church is now being flooded with the Spirit of God where there is no partiality. So women too are coming forward. And why that blessed me is because it's telling me here that every ministry now is growing. It's not just the church, but it is a movement. Tuesday evening, Saturday mornings, both are growing. That will be a true sign that there's a movement being birthed so that they now brought the sick out into the streets. And what's crazy there, but that word brought was they were literally carrying them like they were dead and they were getting ready to bury them. And now instead of taking them to the grave, remember those that usher's ministry, the grave diggers, the pallbearers? Instead of handing them over to them, they were actually taking them out now to the streets. In other words, these were seen as good as dead. So that person in your life that's, oh, it's hopeless. God will never get saved. By the way, that guy's name is Tim. Right? Guy will never get saved. Why say go pick him up and bring him to the Lord? I dare you. I dare you. Take him out to the Lord where the, where the Lord is, his, his path of travel. Put him in the Lord's way and let's see if the Lord will not stop. So they took the sick out into the streets and they laid them there on beds and couches, um, stretchers or bed rules. We find this in Mark chapter 2. And then it says that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. In other words, does, was it Peter's present? Was this superstition? Was this a true power? Or was it just a figure of speech? Also, a multitude began to gather from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem. So people now are going to drive from everywhere to come to South Sioux City to hear the teaching of the word. Do not despise South Sioux City. Don't. This is God's Jerusalem. And it says that all these villages from outside the Siouxland area, or these small towns, were now coming into Jerusalem because the movement was growing. It's no coincidence that we're going through the book of Acts at this time as a church. And it says there, and they were bringing the sick people who were tormented by unclean spirits. We saw that last week. Bringing forth those who were being vexed and troubled and harassed by the demonic. And they were all healed. In other words, they were now being cured once and for all. And the word there, healed, is therapeutic, which, which is where we get our word therapeutic. But in my notes here, it says, check the clock. <laughs> Here's how we're going to conclude. And there was a verse in Jeremiah I was supposed to read to you. Maybe you could read it on your own. But here's the conclusion. Bring those that you see within your life that have a need. Bring them to the Lord. Bring them to the Lord. Introduce. In fact, that's all Christ really does is ask that you would do that grand introduction. Tim, just introduce your family to me. Just introduce your neighbors to me. Man, just introduce me to your community. Just introduce me to them. That they might be in my path to travel and that they too might be cured 100%. Not just of the physical, but of the true need, which is salvation. That their spirit, which is now dead because of the fall, would now be given life. Again, a work that he freely does on the cross and all man has to do is receive it by faith. All man has to do is go, you know what? I can't do it on my own and I would believe that his blood and the cross is adequate for me. That's what the good news is. That's it. We need to repent of our sins, turn the other way, and run to him. And he will meet you every time. The fallacy is that i got to get clean first. Not true. Not true. God will meet that pig or that dog in his vomit right where it is at. Shall we pray? <laughs> Father, I thank you for this time. And for your word, how clear it is. I pray, Lord, that you'd give everyone rest. I could tell some are sleepy and um, yawning and even irritable. Um, but, Lord, I know even when we're grumpy, and I'm Mr. Grumpy. That's what they called me in high school. Um, you're still gracious. And your love, Lord, is spacious and it never ends. But nevertheless, Lord, your word will come to pass. And that should birth in us a great fear. There should be a seriousness in each one of our hearts and in each one of our lives. That indeed you are Lord God and you are not only worthy of worship, but you are deserving of our service. God, help us get there. I know when we examine our own lives, we're like, man, we got nothing to offer. And that's the blessed truth. We ain't got nothing. And that's the beauty. But give that nothing, which is yourself, over to the Lord and he will graciously receive it. 
So Father, I just pray now that everybody here, maybe there's someone here who's heard the message and they've been hearing the message and the Spirit has been provoking them and stirring them and irritating them and they know they need to get right. They know that they cannot leave today without knowing that they've been forgiven of their sins, that their name has been written in the book of life, and that the Father will not be ashamed of you when you stand before Him. Paul would say today is the day of salvation. So Father, while we are praying, I believe this is the appropriate time. If there's anybody here who has heard the message and has not given their hearts over to the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that you would do it today. Jesus paid the price so that you don't have to. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave, our God gives, does not take, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For he did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but so that the world through him might have everlasting life. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God through Christ is everlasting life. So with everybody praying, if you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the time. But I ask that you do it publicly. If you want to receive the Lord, I ask that you would stand where you're at. While Dave is playing this song, let the Spirit examine your heart. And if you want to receive the Lord, while the rest of us are praying, I ask that you stand where you're at so that we might lead you in a prayer. Come just as you are. like pride and embarrassment are keeping you from standing you need to understand Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says that Jesus when he hung on the cross that he endured it and he despised the shame talk about humiliation he did not sin and yet he still died for sin but he would go motivated by love now in Isaiah chapter 55 it says 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. To our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You can leave your completely exonerated. No debt. No debt. Completely paid. <laughs> for your sins of your past, the sins of today, and the sins of the future completely paid for at this moment because his blood is sufficient. Anybody else before we pray? Now for those of you who stand, I would ask that you would simply uh, repeat after me asking Christ to come into your life and to empower you uh, for this new walk that you're getting ready to start with, which has already begun, by the way. Revelations chapter 11 says that one sinner repents. The angels in heaven erupt. In fact, if you're going through the yearly Bible, you read it in Luke, right? Yeah. How they don't rejoice over the 99 Christians who hung out at church, but it's the one. Right now, the angel is like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you mean his blood is sufficient? Follow me in this prayer. Uh, dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Cleanse it. Purify it. And fill it with your spirit. Teach me to thank you. Teach me to follow you. Teach me to love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Now that your spirits have been fed, we want to give you guys two throats. So there's plenty of pastries in the back after this last song. You'll be dismissed. Grab a donut and leave. <laughs> Kidding. Just stand with me. My heart and all that is within, bring it all down for the sake of you, my King. I give you my dreams, I'm breaking down my rights, giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I surrender.